Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Virtual Crosswalk Worship Service. I think we've got a good one for you. Really appreciate you taking the time today. Uh, the teaching's a little bit shorter than I have been in recent weeks. Uh, we'll get to that in just a bit. Uh, but first, I've got a tune or two for you, a meditation, and then uh, we'll get right to the teaching. Enjoy. Sin has lost its power. Death has lost its steam. For our meditation today, I want to take another crack at what we did last week with the word shalom. Just want us to sit with that word and let it do its thing. Uh, shalom is an aspiration. It's a reality. It's a goal. It's a means to a goal. Uh, it encapsulates this idea of this deep peace that uh, we're called to seek, uh, to build our lives on. It is what the kingdom of God is all about. It is the essence or the look of what salvation is literally in the New Testament when Jesus talked about that or eternal life. It's all these things are talking about exactly the same thing and the Hebrew word for that thing is shalom. It's what we're after. It's what our hearts long for. It's what helps us become who we are in our truest selves as children of God. It's what will bring hope and peace to the world really. 
Uh, because we know violence begets violence, but shalom begets shalom. It's where it's at, and it's where we need to be right now. I am so aware, so painfully aware, of how much division is taking place in our world and how much stress uh, we are undergoing uh, with all the different things that are thrown at us uh, in our life today and this year. Political uh, division is off the charts, um, unbelievable, and just, ugh, I just can't wait uh, for this thing to be over. And for, uh, you know, for that pandemic, that's hard. And then we got fires, and then we got smoke, and it's just this ball of stress that we all carry around. And if we don't pay attention to it and deal with it, it's going to eat our lunch. And so this is just a moment, and I encourage you to do it every day through your week, just to take some time, just a few moments even, just to be quiet, to be still, to close your eyes, to breathe deeply, and just say again, over and over and over again in your mind, Shalom. And you might say it out loud even several times, Shalom. So sit comfortably so that you can breathe deeply and slowly. Settle into the chair. Be aware of your surroundings. If your body is achy and you notice stiff points, try to relax them. If your shoulders are all uptight, if your face is scrunched, here's an idea. Take a deep breath. And as you exhale, say, Shalom. Shalom for your body. And as you think about your emotional life, maybe you are totally keyed up and you feel like you're just on edge emotionally. Here's what I'd like you to do. Take a deep breath and on the exhale, just say, Shalom. And maybe mentally you have a massive number of things on your punch list that you can't stop thinking about. And so for you, I want you to think about that punch list and all those things. Take a deep breath and just let it go with the word Shalom. It is possible you have people on your mind today. Some people that you absolutely love, who you really want to pray for. Some people you really can't stand, who you really don't want to pray for. Either way, the word is the same. For those you love, for those you care about who may be going through a tough time, your prayer for them is shalom. And for those you can't stand, guess what? Your prayer for them is shalom. Because really, for both people, we want them to become more whole, more who God made them to be. That's a beautiful thing, that we can pray for anybody because it's good for everybody. So I want you to take some time and picture those people that you love and those people that you don't love so much. And if you still got to do some more work on your physical body or your emotional state or your mental task list, just take a few moments now and then your breathing cycle. Take a deep breath, and as you breathe out, release all these things to God with the word Shalom. I'll give you some time to do that. God, we recognize that the very thing Jesus came to talk about and promote was shalom. The very thing that gave him the confidence and the courage to carry out his mission was shalom. We recognize that the means with which 
he carried out his mission was shalom. And we recognize that the goal, everything he was about and wanted to do here in this life, on into the next, could be summed up by that one word, shalom. May that be our foundation. May that be our means. And may it be our end. Ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of the Go Be Jesus series. Today we're going to be looking at a very, very familiar parable that Jesus told. It's one of these stories that is known uh, all over the world uh, from religious people as well as non-religious people, and it is the Good Samaritan. And luckily, uh, it's so familiar that we're probably not going to need to spend much time on it. So let's just cut to it and then we can enjoy the rest of our day. Here we go from the message version. Just then a religious scholar stood up with a question to test Jesus. Teacher, what do I need to do to get eternal life? He answered, what's written in God's law? How do you interpret it? He said that you love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and muscle and intelligence, and that you love your neighbor as well as you do yourself. Good answer, said Jesus. Do it and you'll live. Looking for a loophole, he said, he asked, and just how would you define neighbor? Jesus answered by telling a story. There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road, but when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. Then a Levite religious man showed up, he also avoided the injured man. A Samaritan traveling the road came on him. When he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. Then he left him, lifted him onto his donkey, led him to an inn, and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver cones and gave them cones, coins, and gave them to the innkeeper, saying. Take good care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you on my way back. What do you think? Which of the three became a neighbor to the man attacked by the robbers? The one who treated him kindly, the religion scholar responded. Jesus said, go and do the same. Well, I don't mean to brag, uh, but I've got this one down. So every week, just about every week, on Wednesdays, uh, after the garbage truck comes and takes away our trash, empties our cans, I go out and I pull back my garbage cans to my side yard. And I go back to the street. And my neighbor's cans, which are sitting there, I take those back too. Good Samaritan in action. I know. I know what you're thinking. It's a good shot that Pete could be up for pastor of the year this year. Maybe even Christian of the year. I mean, come on. That's pretty fantastic stuff. In fact, I think I should probably get busy uh, writing my acceptance speech uh, because I know I'm going to get the award. So have a great week. Uh, we'll see you later. Now, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, shoot. I just uh, looked at my notes here and I'm recognizing that there are a few things that I missed. Um, apparently Pope Francis has some things uh, to say about this. Uh, this is what he talks about when speaking about uh, gl the globalization of indifference, which apparently shows up in the parable. He says, whenever our interior life becomes caught up in its own interests and concerns, there is no longer room for others, no place for the poor. God's voice is no longer heard. The quiet joy of his love is no longer felt. And the desire to do good fades. Well, you got to admit, that's a pretty good point. Luckily, I've got it covered. So, every year at Crosswalk, uh, when it comes time for Super Bowl, 
we invite crosswalkers to bring canned food uh, or whatever else the food pantry needs. And we'll have to say two tables set up in our sanctuary, one for one team that's going to play in the Super Bowl and another for the other team that's going for the grand championship here, right? And so um, most of the time I just grab some stuff and put it on there. But last year was special. This is where Good Sam really shines. Last year, my two favorite teams were going head to head in the Super Bowl, the Kansas City Chiefs and the San Francisco 49ers. Instead of buying one 12 pack of canned chili and splitting that 12 pack, six cans for the Chiefs, six cans for the Niners, you know what I did? Because I care, I bought two 12 packs of canned chili. One pack for the Chiefs, one pack for the 49ers. Impressed, aren't you? Two for two. I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Now let's get back to the speech. Thanks for coming today. Hope you had a great experience. We'll see you next week. Oh, shoot. Sorry. Uh, I just noticed uh, Francis had some more things to say here. So uh, anyway, uh, he continues. Instead of giving up chocolate or alcohol for Lent, the Pope seems to want us to give up indifference to others. In his apostolic exhortation titled Evangelii Gaudium, which means the joy of the gospel, Francis tells us that as a result of indifference, we end up being incapable of feeling compassion at the outcry of the poor, weeping for other people's pain, and feeling a need to help them, as though all this were someone else's responsibility and not our own. Well, I gotta give it to the guy. He's got a good point there. So I guess my garbage can thing isn't enough and my, you know, two 12 packs of canned chili isn't cutting it. Oh, I got it. Uh, so there have been times, now I'm kind of cheating here, but there have been times when I've come across people um, who may not be physically bleeding all over the place, uh, like they've been in an accident or something, but their hearts are broken and they are bleeding, they are gushing uh, pain uh, from usually a, a terrible relationship breakup or maybe they lost their job or some other cataclysmic event. Maybe it's death or something like that, which is horrific. And I got to tell you, I could I could totally uh, use my pastor card on this because that's kind of like part of my job is to do that stuff. But I won't because I think that's cheating. So. I've got another example, a few examples, several examples perhaps, if I think long enough, about times when friends of mine uh, were uh, really in trouble uh, and were facing some extremely painful chapters in their lives. And I knew that what they really needed at that time uh, was a listening ear, uh, just support, some encouragement, maybe a little guidance, you know, uh, how to navigate through, you know, their next chapter or so. And it was all, you know, on my own free time. Um, a lot of times I met them at restaurants and, you know, I'd pick up the bill for whatever we were eating and drinking and just to be there, just to be present, uh, to, to give them help and support. Uh, sometimes we got to do that. And it can cost us more time than maybe we originally would have wanted to or had time to give. And sometimes it even costs us financially uh, to do such things. Uh, but there it is. And sometimes we have to do that. Okay. On to the speech. I'm three for three. All right. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Good grief. I should really uh, look over my notes uh, before I record. Uh, I all right, Pope Francis was great, but uh, you know, there's another guy who's an Anglican, uh, kind of the um, you know the antithesis to Catholicism in the UK, and his name is N. T. Wright, and he happens to be one of the most prolific uh, uh, biblical scholars and Jesus historians out there. And well, he has something to say about this too. This is what he says. He says, when Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan, he did so deliberately to shock his audience. Who is my neighbor? asked the lawyer. And Jesus turned the question back on him. In this story, 
Who turned out to be the neighbor to the man in the ditch? Like so many of Jesus' brilliant stories, it operates at several levels. At the simplest level, of course, it's a spectacular invitation to a life of self-giving love. Love in action. Love that's prepared to roll up its sleeves and help no matter what it takes. Yes, precisely the kind of work we associate with the work of this order. But at the next level down, it's a story designed to split open the worldview of its hearers and let in a shaft of new and unexpected light. Instead of the closed world of Jesus' hearers, in which only their own kith and kin were properly to be counted as neighbors, Jesus demands that they recognize that even the hated and feared Samaritan is to be seen as a neighbor. You know, when I think about enemies uh, today uh, that actually mean something uh, today, I mean, we can think of enemies, you know, half a world away um, that look like terrorists, however we might envision that. But that doesn't really meet us at our home. I mean, this was a real story. This, this well, I mean, it was a parable, but this was a story that, you know, used places and real geography in Jesus' time. You know, people knew this road. They knew... They knew what a Samaritan was, they knew where Jericho was, and they knew that this was a perilous journey. They they could picture this whole thing going down. And I think in order for us to really relate to this, I think we need to do the same. And so as I think about enemies, it's hard for me not to think about uh, where we are right now in our country uh, with the political discord that has become more and more pronounced and divided uh, over the last several years. Uh, it's ugly out there. And you don't have to look very far. In fact, the easiest place to see what I'm talking about is on social media. If you are on Facebook, you know exactly what I'm talking about, or Twitter, whatever your favorite thing might be. It is all over the place, and it is deeply, deeply divided. Uh, I'm seeing some really awful stuff happen of people from various forms uh, of perspectives on this stuff. Uh, People that I know, who I care about, uh, have very different views than other people who I also care about on Facebook, and I'm seeing the clash. And unfortunately, sometimes uh, the way it plays out is not pretty. Um, That good person A, uh, when they're talking about whatever perspective they may have, may be pushing out a post or even saying out of their own mouth some things which I hope it's innocent, but is quite disparaging toward good person B, uh, dehumanizing in some senses, and in some cases calling the other person unpatriotic, like they don't love their country because they don't agree, they don't see things the same way. It's really, really disturbing. Have you experienced this in any way? I know friends who aren't friends anymore uh, because of that, and I'm not talking just Facebook friends, who cares about that, but I mean actually actually real friends, uh, not just in the ether. I even know families that have been torn apart by politics. How stupid, how stupid of a reason uh, that we are siding up with one politician over another and we're allowing that uh, to tear apart what should be one of the strongest bonds that we have. So I wonder, what does it mean to be good Samaritan? In that regard, well, I've said this for some time and for a long time, actually, because the ugliness in in social media has been so pronounced over the last several years that I had to speak into it. And I had to share my disdain about when we see people, particularly at the top leadership positions in our government, are using language that is dehumanizing, uh, is defaming, is insulting, is derogatory, It's flat out inappropriate. And violence generally begets violence. And so the first thing I think about in terms of being a good neighbor, which I'm trying to do, uh, if I want to win the award, I've I've got to go for it, um, is to not play that game. And it is extremely tempting to play that game. Because when somebody takes a swing at you, even if it's with their words, our natural reaction is to be defensive and want to swing back. But violence begets violence. Shalom, which is what Jesus wanted to bring more of into the world, begets shalom. 
And so to be a good Samaritan in a politically charged, hot, divisive, insulting arena of political discourse in our country, which has been allowed and perpetuated and propagated by our top leaders in America, it means we don't play that game. It means we don't follow that leader. We have a choice uh, to add to the problem or to build the kingdom of God. To add to the problem or to build the kingdom of God. As Jesus followers, that is an easy choice because Jesus was one, his whole campaign with his life and his ministry was to usher in and build the kingdom of God, to usher in more and more of the things of Shalom, which remember, uh, speak of a deep peace, not just the absence of conflict, but a deep peace, a harmony between people. You know, on other issues too, this stuff kind of comes about, uh, we're divided in our nation on some pretty serious issues of race. Uh, Black Lives Matter is one of those key points, which is just a lightning rod of controversy right now, which shouldn't be. All Black Lives Matter, the primary thing they're saying is, yeah, all people matter, but black, li- black people in America have not had an equal shot, and they still don't. And it can be proven in the systems that are still allowed to exist in our country. <clears throat> what are we going to do about that? I'm absolutely certain that some of my <clears throat> dear friends who are in that People A group that I talked about uh, earlier, I, I really believe that they want to be anti-racist, that, that's not, that they have an idea for our country where everybody really is treated equally. And I, don't, I, I think they want the best for them. And so uh, that's, what, that's what we're calling out. That's what uh, responding to this would be. Uh, how can we be supportive of equality and equity because I'm pretty confident that that's our heart of heart. So how can we, as Jesus followers, as kingdom builders, how can we speak into that in ways that call that out, that, that draw that out? Another hot issue is immigration in our country, and particularly with <clears throat> undocumented immigrants in our country. In California, certainly, that's a very big deal because now uh, we've got a border. And there's plenty of illegal illegal border crossing that happens uh, at, on the South, uh, as I'm certain is true. So what do we do? How do we respond to this? Well, I can tell you one thing, that when we see that people are detained, and how you feel about that, you know, is one thing. But, but if there's a chance that people are not treated with humanity and dignity, Jesus followers have a pretty clear mandate here. And that is to treat people with dignity and humanity. Don't allow uh, your uh, capacity to follow Jesus, to build in shalom, to be generous toward the other, who you might even deem as the enemy. Don't allow that political divisiveness, that hatred, that position on an issue, don't allow that to keep you from being compassionate toward the people who are in desperate need. So, This is tough stuff. Apparently this is getting a little harder than just moving trash cans and buying chili and sitting down with somebody who's bleeding all over the place uh, to give them uh, support and encouragement and love. Apparently uh, this thing is a little more challenging than that and requires something more of it. In fact, uh, just to continue on, see, I checked my notes this time. Uh, Jim Wallace, uh, who is the author of a book called Christ in Crisis, which challenges us to think about what it means to be Jesus' people in this very, very divided age. He says, Jesus is truly brilliant here. First, the best example of a neighbor is a hated outsider, a Samaritan, who demonstrates in the clearest way what a good neighbor is, someone who crosses boundaries to help someone else in need, risks his own safety and security, takes time out from his routine and certainly the daily uh, the schedule for his day, changes the plan for his whole trip, invests not only his time, but also his resources, enlists others in his strategy, and then comes back to check to make sure that the injured man is being taken care of and healed of his wounds, all across rigid ethnic lines and national borders. Now that is a neighbor, says Jesus. You can imagine the young lawyer's face when the concept of his neighbor just got expanded more than he ever could have imagined. Theologian and historian Gustavo Gutierrez offered insight as well. His take, 
Who is my neighbor? The neighbor was the Samaritan who approached the wounded man and made him his neighbor. The neighbor is not who is not he whom I find in my path, but rather he in whose paths path I place myself, he whom I approach and actively seek. Let me read that again because I totally screwed it up. Who is my neighbor? The neighbor was the Samaritan who approached the wounded man and made him his neighbor. The neighbor is not he whom I find in my path, but rather he in whose path I place myself, he whom I'm appro- I approach and actively seek. In other words, Jesus' teaching here in this parable calls us uh, to look for who that neighbor is. Look for the person who is hurting and go and respond letting go of our biases and our prejudices and everything else that might get in the way. It means that when we see hurt and suffering, we respond. It comes back down to the question, are we, uh, are we going to be a part of the problem? Or are we going to build the kingdom? And following Jesus means we do the thing that helps build the kingdom. Okay, <clears throat> I guess we're done. Have a great week. Good to see you. Take care. No, hold on. I can't do it. There's, eh, you know, the more I think about this, the more I realize that there's just something more I need to say. Uh, because as I'm reading all these people and thinking about this, uh, uh, it dawns on me that we could do all these things. Uh, we could uh, roll garbage cans back to the side yard. We could buy cans of chili. Uh, we could sit down with people who are hurting. And we could even, you know, do this extraordinary thing of trying to speak peace into volatile Facebook posts and even say nice things about being anti-racist, even if we don't agree with Black Lives Matter. If that's where you're at, I happen to agree with them, but if that's where you're at, uh, we can do that kind of a thing. And we can, um, you know, even uh, buy blankets for the children who've been separated from their families, you know, uh, at detention centers at the border. This, this kind of, we can help with the humanity effort down there. These are, these are all things, but we could do all of those things and still miss the most important part of these first and second great commandments. Because do you remember the first and second great, greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The word that shows up in both those commandments is love. And it just dawns on me that we could completely do all of these things in such a mechanical fashion, almost like they are a punch list for us to complete, and still not experience love, still not really give love, and certainly not be motivated by love. We have that capacity to do loving things without love. And love is the answer. Love is the answer. That is the thing that God is calling us to do. That's the thing that Jesus came to proclaim. Remember, shalom, you know, that's the fruit of the love of God, of discovering the love of God in our lives and how deep that penetrates us and how how much it grounds us and founds us when we understand that we are made in the image of God, that we're deeply loved by God, that when God sees us, he doesn't just say, hey, that's good, but that's very, very good, that we are completely unique in all of creation, that here we are, we have the Spirit of God in our hearts, in us. It's what animates us. It's what helps us understand what love even is in the first place. And yet, you and I are each living in a very specific context of space and time. And you and I both have exceedingly unique genetic codes. There will never be anybody ever like me in the future. And there has never been anybody like me in the past. Some of you are very grateful for that. But what I mean is, that's also you. That's you. The the creative force in all of the universe says, my way, my essence, my ethos is love. You are created in love. No matter what the rest of the world says, no matter what your context is, no matter your family of upbringing, no matter if you don't have a job, if you've just been broken up with, if you feel terrible about yourself, here's the thing to build your life on. You were made in love. And the love that holds the whole universe together loves you. When this God, when this presence sees you, this God cannot help 
but gush. This God loves you so much. When we found our lives on that, we find ourselves secure, grounded, founded on rock that helps us withstand anything, helps us get through the hardest storms because it does not shatter who we are. And when we really allow this to happen and take root, something dramatic happens. We are transported, not into some other, you know, so heavenly minded or of no earthly good kind of a place, but our eyes are changed. Our paradigms are changed. We see the world differently and we enter the world differently. We see through eyes of love, through the eyes of God. When we're in that place of love, when love is the dominant feature of our lives because we're grounded in it and we foster that in our relationship with God and what we do, which interestingly, that experience of the love of God is built in part by doing the things that Jesus called us to do. So it's not just a bunch of navel gazing, but it's a, seriously, it's actually doing what Jesus has us do. And we grow in our understanding of love and all this. When that happens, our world just changes. We naturally lend ourselves to things of shalom. Shalom becomes the fruit of love in our lives. We more naturally seek that depth of peace and love between people in relationships between the people and creation and create all the whole thing. It is much easier to sow the love of God when we're gr grounded in the love of God. It's when we're in that space that we totally get what Jesus said, uh, that my yoke is easy and my burden is light because it is. It changes us from the inside out and we find ourselves different people. None other than Martin Luther King Jr. in his last speech that he gave, literally the day before he was assassinated, he talked about uh, this same parable that we're looking at today. And he had something to say about it. And the final thing that he says in this particular lift out of his speech is just so powerful. Listen to what he had to say. In the days of Jesus, it came to be known as the bloody path. You know, it's possible that the priest and the Levite looked over that man on the ground and wondered if the robbers were still around. Or it's possible that they felt that the man on the ground was merely faking. And he was acting like he had been robbed and hurt in order to seize them over there, love them there for quick and easy seizure. And so the first question that the priest asked, the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the Good Samaritan came by, and he reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? My friends, I know this is a familiar story. It's all about serving. It's all about looking to the other, and the Good Samaritan is our model for that. I hope that some of the things that I've shared with you today have uh, refreshed the story for you and made you think in different ways. I hope you realize that there are very small things you can do uh, that are very neighborly and very good, like pulling back garbage cans and buying extra chili for uh, our food pantry and spending extra time with people who really need it, and even trying to you know, be a different force in uh, the political a mess that we have being the wars being waged on Facebook. But more than that, I hope you find yourself falling more and more deeply in love with the God who deeply, eternally, unconditionally loves you. Because that'll change your life. And that'll change the world. In fact, I'm so convinced of it that when it happens to us, when we think about the model prayer that Jesus gave us, the Lord's Prayer, it rolls easy off the tongue. It's just who we want to be. It's no longer this burden. It's who we want to be. And so from that hope for some of you who are working on the love piece, and for some of you who are deeply in love with the love of God, I invite you to say with me um, Eugene Peterson's version of the Lord's Prayer as we close our time together. For real, as we close our time together. Would you pray it with me? Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Do what's best. As above, 
so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You are in charge. You can do anything you want. You're ablaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. My friends, may you find yourself immersed more and more in shalom as you ground yourself in shalom, as you give yourself to the to the project of bringing more shalom into the world. And may you see shalom more and more unfold right before your very eyes. Have a great week. I hope to see you at Praxis this week. If not, have a safe one, and we'll see you the next time. Thanks a lot.